All right, well, welcome to the uh, Civic Camp Citizens Ward 8 Councillor Forum. Thank you very much for attending tonight and showing interest in issues that shape our city. My name is Jason Markasoff uh, from the Calgary will be your moderator tonight. Those of you not familiar with Civic Camp, it's a nonpartisan public advocacy group enabling citizens to engage in creating a city that works for all. Any Calgarian is welcome to become a Civic Camper by visiting civiccamp.org and learning more about the organization, what values Civic Campers have set out for themselves, and join up with a group that interests them. One of those groups is the Election Initiatives Groups. Uh, they've been holding forums in every ward. They hold, held probably the only mayor's uh, public forum last night, for those of you who were watching and laughing along. <laughs> um, and also held uh, debates at the trustee level. Uh, so uh, let's please give Civic Camp a hand for... Uh, Many, many Civic Camp volunteers have donated their time to make tonight's event a reality. And we couldn't have done it without a few sponsors as well who generously donated their time and services as well. First, I'd like to thank tonight, Brown Peak Community Association for the donation of the venue. Uh, you guys can hold your applause until we get to the rest of them at the end. Uh, I want to thank uh, also Calgary Sound Rentals for making sure I don't speak too closely into the mic and the Calgary Roadrunners for providing equipment for tonight's forum at a significantly reduced rate. I'd like to also thank our media partners, CBC Calgary, CJSW, Fast Forward, and Metro Calgary, all of my fine competitors for helping get the word out <laughs> about these forums. I'd like to also thank the Calgary Association of Parents and School Councils and the Alberta Teachers Federation, um, oh, sorry, Alberta Teachers Association, for their support with the School Board Trustee Citizens Forums. Um, and also the Calgary Foundation helped us pay the few bills that we did acquire. And thanks uh, for the three of you, the candidates, for coming out. And all of you as well. So the ground rules, uh, Civic Camp likes its process and rules. Um, Civic Campers have named these forums Citizen Forums because the questions for the first two-thirds of the night's forum have been sourced from Calgarians at large. Civic Camp asked Calgarians what they would like to be asked at these forums. Uh, several questions were submitted by about dozens of Calgarians. Then they voted metric gobs of times for which uh, for questions they thought were most important. The top vote getting questions we'll, we will be asking tonight. Here's how the format will work. Um, I will ask uh, candidates each probably three or if we have time more questions and you'll be provided a minute and a half to respond to each question. Uh, then in the interest of time only two of you will be asked the question uh, for a minute and a half and um, then those candidates asked to respond will be drawn randomly before the question is asked. Um, because we can't have each candidate answer every question, we, but we do want to have the opportunity to, for each candidate to answer. Um, you have poker chips in front of you. You have five poker chips. And uh, if you'd like to throw in your two cents or a butt, uh, you can throw in a poker chip and you'll get a minute to respond uh, to that. So use your poker chips wisely. Uh, it's, a good, uh, it's a good exercise in fiscal and... Uh, resource uh, responsibility. <laughs> um, and I, is, I don't know if you guys, let, let me know afterwards if this is a good model for budgeting later on. <laughs> How many poker chips for the parks department? Uh, to ensure we have some ward questions, is, oh, and I forgot that, I've never done this before, please make sure you've turned off all your cell phones, ringers, and, uh, and, and randomized foghorns, please. Um, to ensure to ensure more, uh, some more specific questions are asked because uh, the Civic Camp sourced ones are citywide. Mm -hmm. uh, we have paper at the sides here, um, and during the break, you can uh, write in some questions and hand them in, and uh, we'll uh, ask them after the break. Uh, working with me tonight are Lauren and uh, Cheryl and Brandon. Thanks very much. Give them an applause. for blinding the, uh, the voters with the, uh, ver the candidates with a very bright uh, time clock that will keep them in check. She has more of an orangey glow than we do. <laughs> <sighs> anyway, um, and I'd like to ask the candidates, uh, to, I'd like to remind them of the rules of etiquette for this forum. Uh, one, respect the clock. Um, I will make loud buzzing noises if you don't over your answer. Um, make it easy for the audience to listen. Don't interrupt each other please. Uh, stay issues focused. This is a forum, not a debate. Uh, we want to hear your ideas. Uh, please avoid personal references or criticism directed at your fellow candidates. 
Um, and uh, similarly, for a conduct, please do not heckle or uh, chant. Um, you can yell at bingo if you have the cards here and you get a, get a line. That's, I will allow that, possibly. But I will have to come up, you'll have to bring it up to check if it's a fake bingo. Um, and let the audience decide. We ask supporters leave their signs outside the room. Um, they are at the side there if you want to get a glance at their lovely colors. Uh, and applause is okay, but please, uh, no other uh, comments from the cheap seats. Um, like so we can't talk? No, you can't talk. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> Except for now, uh, when I'd like to ask our candidates to introduce themselves and uh, give them each two minutes to tell them a little about themselves. We'll start with uh, Evan Woolley. Hi. Thanks, thanks so much to Civic Camp for having me out, and a special thanks to the Bankview Community Association. I can't remember all of the other people that were supporting partnerships, but thanks to everybody, and thanks to you all for coming out here tonight. Um, the first question I'm always asked is, is, why am I running? I'm running because I love where I live. Uh, I was born at the Holy Cross Hospital. Uh, I was raised in the neighborhoods around this ward, and it's here that I want to raise my own family and spend my life. I have over a decade of experience in community development. Most recently, I worked with the Public Art Program, uh, where we worked on a whole range of different community cultural development initiatives. I spent two years in the Office of Sustainability, the City Manager's Office. Uh, we worked on Imagine Calgary Partnership. I was the Chair of uh, Engagement for the Calgary Food Committee, where we undertook a food system assessment. Uh, the Mayor appointment appointed me to his uh, Committee on Civic Engagement, where we launched the Three Things for Calgary initiative. This initiative was all about connecting uh, citizens with their communities. Um, I've spent a number of years in uh, the oil and gas sector working in community development as well and government relations and before that uh, for the provincial government. Um, it's in these neighborhoods that uh, we need to make decisions about what happens in them and I'm, and I'm looking forward to fighting really hard for that. The role of councillor is to connect our citizens with City Hall. It's about connecting businesses, res residents and organizations with the work of our municipal government and making our municipal government work for citizens. Um, altogether, this is community engagement. Community engagement is what I do best. If elected, I promise to work hard for you. I promise to answer the phone when you call. I promise to, to meet with you if you have a challenge or an idea. Um, if elected, I want to build a sustainable city. I want to regulate secondary suites. I want to make it easier to catch a bus between our inner city neighborhoods. I want to make it less cumbersome to open a small business. I want to take care of those in our society who need our help the most. And I want to work with communities to make our neighborhoods the best places they can be. Thank you very much, Evan. And let's please welcome uh, Ian Newman. Hello there, my name is Ian Newman. Uh, for those of you that have uh, seen me before, we've done about three of these now together. I like to open with a little bit of a joke. Uh, just to set the tone for the rest of the evening. I was out today and uh, setting up my signs. I just got some new signs. You can see them over there, but they're little. And I was trying to think of a joke to tell tonight just to, just to get us off on a lighter note. And I was setting my, 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 my sign in the ground. I looked over and there was this big John Mark <coughs> sign beside me. And I looked over and there was this big uh, Evan Moody sign beside me. And I was like, what are these guys compensating for? <laughs> I don't really know. So, so that's our little light humor for the talk. <laughs> so, uh, why am I running for city council? I guess at the end of the day, when I uh, started this road in about January, we started going to some uh, city council meetings, talking with people. Uh, we had looked at what the incumbent has done over the last six years. He's done quite a bit, and there's a few things that he came short on, in my opinion. We found out that uh, Evan was running as well. And I said, well, where's, where's my voice? Where's the voice of the ordinary Calgarian who works hard every day, who's struggling a little bit to pay rent and tra get through the city streets or take a bus? Uh, where's the voice that isn't so politically inclined, it isn't so bureaucratically compliant? So I set out on the journey and then the floods hit. And for those of you that know me, I'm a flood guy, that's what I do. My, uh, my campaign went on hold for the summer while I did some flood restoration and I had to ask, do I want to keep in the race? And I said, you know what, yes, because Ward 8 deserves to have three alternatives. Uh, I think John Marr has a turn for the status quo. I think Evan brings a good, uh, a good conversation to the table as well. And I'm here to be, for the ordinary person, let's get, let's get our taxes and rents in order and make things a little bit more affordable and also do some of the things that the other candidates are both vying for. So I'm not here to be partisan. Uh, thank you very much.
thanks, Ian, for providing a decent example of uh, the kind of jokes we don't want to hear tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you threw a short rope in there, and I don't know why I have a little Scotty towel <laughs> my microphone up. I don't know. That's uh, kind of weird. Uh, well, good evening, and thank you for uh, for coming out tonight. Uh, is this on? Can we hear it? Okay. Uh, I wanted to thank you all, and especially to the Bankview Community Association and Civic Camp. I have been your alderman for the last six years. Recently, the city of Calgary was just named the fifth most livable city in the world. And that's why I'm raising my family here. That's why my wife and I are raising our children here. I've lived in Calgary my whole life. I've lived in Ward 8 my whole life. And the fact that Calgary has been named the fifth most, civil, uh, most uh, livable city in the world isn't done by accident. It's because of the leadership that your city council has. It's because of the incredible work that we have being done by 22,000 of the hardest working Calgarians you'll ever meet, the city staff. Over that time period, we've also been reinforced by the community, or sorry, by our, our citizen satisfaction survey, which tells us again that Calgarians are getting what they want when they need it, and they're very, very pleased with how their municipal government is being run. The most fiscally responsible the most transparent and the most open government. That's my record. That's what I've been doing for you. I've been working in the trenches for the last six years. I've been going to your community in all meetings. I've been meeting you at your, at your coffee shops, in your homes. I've been responding to your telephone calls, to your emails, and even on Twitter. So that's who I am. That's why I'm running. And that's why I need your support again on October 21st. Much, gentlemen. Now we're going to go to our crowdsourced uh, questions, and first one to answer will uh, we'll go backwards. <coughs> John Mark, and to respond will be <coughs> Evan Woolley. Uh, first question: Do you support legalization of secondary suites in all existing neighborhoods, subject only to reasonable safety concerns? Why or why not? Uh, John, a uh, minute and a half first, please. Okay. So the first. Excuse me. Sorry. The mics are directional, and the media can't pick up on the inputs if you don't speak in. Like, just, is it okay? Do so you want me to sit? Is it okay if I'll use that? Yeah. So, just as the mics are directional, we've done. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So, <laughs> minor technical di difficulty there. Okay. Um, can you read the question again now? Sure. Uh, do you support legalization of secondary suites in all existing neighborhoods, subject to only reasonable safety concerns? Why or why not? Short answer. Yes. And if you'll recall, I actually wrote about it. In September of, uh, of this year, this council meeting, I actually moved a emergency motion at council after the flood to actually legalize secondary suites because it is an emerging issue, because it has been something that our council has not been able to achieve yet. Now, is that time coming? We believe it, it could be, potentially, if the right members of council are supportive. I know that everyone in this room is, is uh, this is a big, big, big issue for our ward. Uh, will I support it? Yes. Have I supported it every single time that it's come to council for an individual application? I have. That's my record. That's what I believe. That's what Ward 8 is asking for. And that's, that's absolutely what I will do when, if I am re-elected uh, as your city councilor. Thank you. A uh, minute and a half uh, to Evan. Um, we should have had secondary suites a long time ago. We're one of the last cities in North America to not have secondary suites. Um, there's been no movement in council on this. This is critical, critical for our neighborhoods in a whole ton of different ways. Um, it shouldn't take a flood uh, and 0% vacancy rates uh, to move along secondary suites. It's the most important piece of the puzzle to get affordable housing supply. It allows people from different demographics in different neighborhoods to do it. Um, if you look at our website, there's a ton of information on some of the, the lack of accountability and responsibility from council members. Um, I know that we can't talk personally about council members, but this is an important uh, issue, extremely important, that's been sidelined by, by uh, the incumbent on this issue. So we can do much better, and this is critically now. Um, enough talk, this should have happened a long, long time ago, and we deserve much better. Peter, can I give you my cell phone so I'm not tempted to tweet tonight? <laughs> <laughs> You're too hard. Can I tweet for you? Uh, I don't know if the Herald will like that. <laughs> my ability. Um, thank you very much, guys. 
Uh, next question will go to Ian. Be responded to by um, your blue John. Uh, I'm blue. John Mar. Yeah. Uh, so, Ian, your question is, how will you ensure all Calgarians have access to the recreational and sports facilities they need for their ongoing health and well-being? minute and a half. I don't know whether I like sitting down or standing up. Um, as far as access to uh, recreational facilities, I think those who have a good, uh, have great access to, to the facilities that we have. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to see is we work with those that are in the, under the poverty line. I remember seeing an ad in the paper and on the radio a few years ago of X number of, uh, of Canadians are, can't afford to play in organized sports. Well, that's something that definitely happens on the municipal level, and we should be very, very active with ensuring that all those children and adults, too, have affordable access to the facilities that the city provides, uh, whether they be soccer fields or whether they be the Talisman Centre or whatnot. Most of them are quite affordable as it is. For me, I, I do okay. But, uh, but we really got to look out for those people that don't necessarily have access. So I would see, you know, maybe the same thing we're doing with bus passes, making sure that maybe we have passes that are graded on income and someone can apply to have, these, uh, to have access to this. I mean, we all know that if people have access to, to good uh, uh, recreational facilities, they're living active lives, they're healthy people, they're in their community meeting people and not just sitting in their apartment downtown or sitting almost as a shut-in in a basement, and that goes for elderly as well as children and their, people of every age. So that's the short answer. Thanks. Thanks very much. John Marr, a minute and a half, please. I'm going to try and stand. I'm too short to sit. So uh, the question with regards to infrastructure and community recreational facilities. Well, over the last three years, it's been my great honor to be the chairman of Community Protective Services. And I actually moved the creation of the new $42 million Community Infrastructure Fund. And what that's allowed us to do is build three new rec halls uh, that are being constructed right now, as well as the new downtown library. It can't just be about physical fitness and sports facilities. It's got to be about recreating in open spaces. That's why we've created three new parks in, the belt, in, uh, in Ward 8, as well as creating pedestrian realms like the new uh, 13th Avenue Greenway. But I want to segue back to a comment that was made a few seconds ago about secondary suites and how this council hasn't moved forward Sean, on it. Uh, actually, I, I was, I was remiss uh, in the chip thing, but there is a question about that coming up that I'll give you a chance on, if I could. I'm sorry, okay. but I will give you another chip. There'll be opportunity to talk about affordable housing very soon. Okay. 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 Well, so uh, thank you so much for your I, I, I do apologize for that, uh, John Marr, but uh, you'll get a chance to uh, talk about secondary suites shortly. I'm okay. sorry about that. Uh, we had a chip from uh, Ian Newman. It's not necessarily a rebuttal, but just in what the incumbent just stated. I just want to make sure that we understand the difference between building a multi-million dollar facility and giving people access to that facility. So if I had to just stress one point, because in some of these debates we've talked a lot about poverty and homelessness and a few other things, and having something and having access to it are two entirely different things. Um, our third question will go to uh, Evan Woolley first, uh, followed by Ian Newman. And uh, if somebody does want to put in a poker chip on this one, by all means. Uh, with a vacancy rate approaching 0%, what long-term action will you take to ensure young professionals and students have a place to live in Calgary? Evan Woolley, please, a minute and a half. Um, so again, uh, this issue is arising uh, again and again. And secondary suites are the best way to increase uh, affordable housing supply in the city quickly and, and, and in, in a safe way. Um, secondary suites are, are, are about, an, uh, they can cover a number of things. One, uh, rentals, rent, rental supply for students and people of different incomes. Um, our what makes great neighborhoods and cool neighborhoods is where you can have a doctor living next to a student, living next to an engineer, living next to a real estate agent. Um, this is what makes great vibrant neighborhoods. Um, it's often very uh, prohibitive for people to buy in the inner city. The opportunity to have a secondary suite will allow you to supplement your mortgage and live in the inner city in a house. If you're a senior, where we've got seniors all over the inner city in established neighborhoods getting priced out of their homes, the ability for them to have a secondary suite will help 
them have the ability to stay in their homes for much longer. Um, there's a number of different ways, especially uh, working with the provincial government on, on land land swaps. The city can, can increase its affordable housing supply in a whole range of different ways, but we have a lot of land in the inner city, and we, there's opportunities for the city of Calgary to use some of this land to build, work with developers to build affordable housing units. Um, but again, critical is secondary suites. We need to do this now. Thank you. minute and a half, uh, Ian Newman, thanks. Um, I think secondary suites definitely form a part of the equation, uh, but for me, not all of it. I mean, there's only so many secondary suites you can build. For me, it's definitely building, I don't want to call them mega structures, but we need to be building a lot more high-rise rental apartment buildings. When young professionals move to the city, they come with large student loans, they're deeply in debt, they need to have a rent that allows them to save up for a down payment on that house in the suburbs, we, we won't get into that, but that house in the suburbs and or that expensive condo, that's $600,000 now. Um, and if they're renting off someone who has just a spec, you know, per, bought a condo for speculation, their rent is not at a place uh, where they're going to be able to save. So I would, I would encourage developers and business through incentives, whatever they may be, I don't want to say the word subsidy, but there is land, as Evan has said and as the incumbent has said in other debates, there is land there to use and that needs to be developed. Let's get it developing for the things we need over the next 10 years that are going to keep people here and not have them move here, have a great job as an engineer, and then they're gone. You know, they need to be able to afford to live here and save up and raise and grow into their life. And that's for you. Thank you. Uh, we have a minute, uh, a minute requested by uh, John Mark. Okay, I'm having all sorts of problems. Uh, so my question, or, or the, the question of our secondary suites and what are we going to do about housing, it's actually a two-pronged issue. Secondary suites is one part of the equation, absolutely, no question about it. We've seen in Edmonton that their uptick on it is actually only about 200 out of a population of a million per year. That's not going to cover the, the problems that we're ha we have as a municipality. We need to look at our long-term solutions. And one of those things is working on the 10-year plan to end homelessness. I sat on the 10-year plan. Uh, I'm helping to deliver 224 units of affordable housing to the mustard seed, which is probably one of the most proud accomplishments I've had uh, since being elected to office. But we're also building affordable rental accommodations for the first time in a generation. There are two new buildings that are being developed right now. One, the Royal Vista down on uh, 12th. And uh, I have just actually been meeting with city staff and another development to help to bring Thank an you, empty hole back into life. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Our next question will go first to Ian Newman. And response by uh, Evan Woolley. So Ian Newman first uh, with the question, do you believe that urban sprawl is a problem for the city? If you believe it is a problem, what will you do to address it? Well, I just wrote on my blog about this today. Um, I think soon you'll be ready. the more hey, soon I'll be ready to answer. Yeah, the more I listen to this question, I, I don't know if I want to say that urban sprawl is a problem. Uh, I'll say it is where we're at. Um, we started building a city or growing a city quite rapidly 30 years ago when the boom happened, and that vision included suburbs and lakes and big yards so people could live in. Uh, it isn't that, and I, and I said in the blog today, I don't think it's, I think it's a big model, and I think it's an expensive model, and I think we come to the realization that it's not a sustainable model and we can't afford it. So is it a problem? Yes, the cost of it is a problem, and we need to figure out how to pay for it and how to pay for what we've built already. And then we need to get into a, a different a, arrangement with the development community to build the next 30 years. So let's not focus on what we did wrong in the past. Let's stop, regroup, and let's build for the city of the future. I believe the Municipal Development Plan outlines that, gives a vision of that, and as long as Council uh, listens to the heart of the word and not just the words, I think we're going to have a great city in 50 years, and I think the city will be big enough uh, to do that. And, and I, think, I think we're in a good spot. We just have to turn the ship a little bit. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Woolley. So as, as many of you know, the city has been growing rapidly, uh, mostly in our far-flung suburbs, and it doesn't make sense that we're subsidizing suburban sprawl. 
I've knocked on 9,000 doors in our established and inner city communities, and people can point to falling apart sidewalks and streets. They can point to their aging infrastructure in inner city, and they can say, why is my tax dollars going to subsidize new, new roads and sidewalks in our far-flung suburbs when we have our own inner city uh, infrastructure issues here? It's like with any investment, we pay lots of property taxes, and we've seen our property taxes go up substantially over the last six years. And when you're not seeing a return on the investment of your property taxes, you start to wonder why. And we haven't had good representation in our inner city uh, that's really fighting for this critical, critical infrastructure. There's a ton of pressure being put on our established neighborhoods and inner city communities um, because of this sprawl, and, and that pressure uh, is, is seen in our roads and sidewalks. Um, this isn't about pitting suburbs against the inner city. This is about housing choice, and it's about letting the market decide. But when we're subsidizing one form of growth over the other, it doesn't make sense. And in the, unfortunately, the incumbent has been, uh, has been part of this problem and not the solution. Thank you. Um, the occasional groan is accepted, I suppose, uh, in certain cases. Um, Mr. Mark. So I wanted to just respond to that. The first and foremost issue is, is that development and growth, regardless if it's inner city or greenfield or, or brownfield, development has to pay for itself. That's the way it should be. We shouldn't be subsidizing anybody. The issue now is how do we go about doing that? And if you look at my voting record, and what we've done as a city is that we've taken and added a $17,000 development level to the cost of every new lot. Now, we wanted to be able to bring a zero subsidy. It's not going to happen until the next development term agreement, which is in two more years. When that happens, I will support whatever the administration brings to reduce it down to zero, which is going to be probably in 2015. When that happens, my record has been that I've spoken in favor of reducing the, uh, the development subsidy. I voted in favor of it, and it passed. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we have another tip from Evan Woolley. Um, I mean, speak, seeing as he's speaking of his record, I think it's, it's fair if I, if I have a few comments here. Um, in May 2011, uh, they, did, they did vote to reduce it, but it's not reducing it. It's actually voted to elect a four, they voted on a, on a deal that was a $4,800 subsidy to suburban developers, and this is a sweetheart deal. Um, we voted, the incumbent voted against the mayor when we sought to reduce the deal from five years to three years. And when, when council had looked at taking that deal and throwing it out the window and starting from scratch, again, the incumbent voted against the mayor on this. So there's something called the say-do gap, and the mayor talks about it a lot. And it's what we say we're going to do, and then it's what we do. And I would encourage everybody to check out ward8yyc.ca, and you can find out a lot of facts on there about that say-do gap. Thank you. So guess what? <laughs> do I always side with the mayor? No, I don't. You know why? Because we're colleagues. He's not my boss. You're my boss. And when I say that I'm going to support something, I will do it. When I say that I'm going to reduce the subsidy and have voted in the past to do so, absolutely, the record shows irrefutably that that was the case. Now, it's very difficult because when we're talking about a deal that the administration brings, we support the deal that the administration brings. We don't sit there and negotiate with the development industry ourselves. Does anybody think that that would be a good idea if council members got into direct negotiations with developers? I don't think so. So what we do is we make sure that we support the administration and provide for the vision for that we have for the city of Calgary. That's my record. That's the truth. And you can count on that. Just, uh, just, thanks for waking me up. Just because it's so heated, I think we should throw in a third possible uh, uh, comment. Um, I guess at the end of the day for me, I've heard the word deal and deal and deal and deal. And I think what Calgary's are upset about is all these deals that are going on. The city is $3 billion in debt because it's not a very good deal maker, especially when it comes to development. So in my opinion, the city should get out of the deal making business and should create a vision 
push that vision and work with the development industry, work with them, not make deals with them, uh, to build what, what citizens want and what the market will pay for. Any more, any more chips? Uh, there, there are no uh, fiscal chip reserves here, so use them wisely. Um, our next question will go to Evan Woolley to start. How do you think we can generate, create mo greater mobility choices, biking, walking, and transit, in addition to cars uh, in the city and your ward? And the response will go to John Mark. So, for a minute and a half. Can you repeat the oh, question? Sure thing. How do you think we can create greater mobility choices, biking, walking, and transit, in addition to cars, both in the city and in your ward? A uh, minute and a half. Uh, so we, we, this, the city is a massive city geography-wise, and what we've done is we've built a transportation system based on putting, pushing people into downtown and out of downtown. And it, it, it's, not, it's not a sustainable system of transportation, especially with regards to our communities. Um, bus routes remain, uh, remain full, so when you take the number three or the number, four, uh, or the number seven into downtown, often in the winter, three or four buses will pass you. Um, it's impossible for me to get from Cliff Bungalow to Inglewood. Um, there's a whole ton of inner city transportation uh, and mobility needs that have not been addressed adequately. We have a cycling strategy. Some of it's been implemented. I'm very in favor of, of it, but n pieces have not been implemented in our inner city communities. Uh, the 10th Avenue bike lane has been a total disaster. Um, walking. Walking is a huge, is a huge uh, part of the community. We need to develop a, a walking and pedestrian strategy because moving around our streets and, and some of our sidewalks is, is critical for us getting around. Um, we have our, our one ways and two ways. 11th and 12th Avenue I've advocated for turning into two way streets because there's nothing that kills a neighborhood or a business district like a one way street. Um, and again, so we, we need somebody on council fighting transportation issues, we've not seen it. I'm very supportive of Route Ahead, but route ahead, route, the Route Ahead uh, plan deals with no inner city transit loop. So we need to get around our communities, not just in and out of downtown. Thank you. So we do need somebody that's fighting for these things. It's exactly what I've been doing for the last six years. So if you look at my record, Route Ahead, which is our 30-year vision for transit. I voted in favor of that and added the uh, in inner city transit loop to be part of the study. We don't have any money to build these things right now. The other thing was council, your council, actually inverted our pyramid and made sure that pedestrians are going to be thought of as our first priority. Going down in a pyramid to single passenger automobiles being the last in favor. What are we doing? Well, we're creating the new 8th Street pedestrian uh, thoroughfare that goes from 14th Street all the way to Eau Claire. That's new visions. You want to see new pedestrian realms? Look at the 13th Avenue Greenway. You want to know what we're doing for pedestrians? Have a look at the new underpasses at 1st Street and 4th Street. Those are the things that are, that are happening in the inner city right now. That's increasing pedestrian connectivity. We're also moving forward on a cycling strategy. In fact, I helped to create the very first individual cycle track here in the city of Calgary. Moving far more infrastructure for cyclists, far more infrastructure including the brand new West LRT that's taking 35,000 people per day, taking 6,000 cars off our road, and 40,000 greenhouse emissions. That's my record, and that's why I need your support to continue that on October 21st. So, what Mr. Maher is talking about is big city projects, and those are great, but what we need in Ward 8 are community projects. The single track cycling lane that's on 7th Street doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't feed you on it, it actually only helps people in, uh, in, in, in Ward 7 and north of the Bow River, so it doesn't actually benefit our inner city communities. You can talk about visioning, but what we've had is six years of, of, of a lot of talk and not a lot of action. Um, this, the, these, one ways, these one ways on 11th and 12th, the community has been asking for these for a long time and there's still no movement on it. The West LRT is really, really wonderful, but there wasn't proper engagement done on it. Um, it was supposed to be $700 million and it ended up being $1.4 or $1.2 billion, so over double over budget. Um, and the inner city transit loop is not on the route ahead and that was a critical piece. And so we can't just keep on talking about putting it in a, into a plan of a plan of plan. We need to, we need to start to, uh, to act on plans and to start to make this stuff happen because again, that say-do gap is getting uh, to be tired old talk. Thank you. Yeah.
to support the Calgary Poverty Reduction Initiative, and how would your efforts improve that initiative? So, the very first thing that I was mentioning earlier about affordability and, and uh, homelessness is I sat on the 10-year plan to end homelessness, which is we are now in year four off. I also sit as a board member of the Calgary Housing Company, which provides over 5,000 units of affordable housing for Calgarians that are most affected by financial stress. I also believe that what we need to do is make sure that when we're thinking about our citizens, that we're thinking about how are we going to make sure that we're looking after our kinship. All of our citizens need to be treated equally and fairly. How are we doing this? We're going through the 10-year plan. We're building right now in the Beltline 224 units of affordable housing. I sit on, on Calgary Housing, which provides another 5,000 units of affordable housing. And we're going to work on secondary suites. And this time, Council will get it done. <coughs> I need your support to make sure that happens. In 2000, or sorry, on October 21st, please support us. Let us get on with this. Thank you very much. Uh, poverty is a really complicated question, and I, I think that we, we touched on a little bit earlier when we talked about accessibility and making sure that people have opportunities that they may not other ha otherwise have. Um, you know, out of the three people up here, I'm probably the one that knows poverty the best. Um, I, I did work my way up, and, and most of you would have considered my childhood poor. Um, and I got here uh, through help, through community organizations, friends, family, a good job, a good mentor, people around me, all of those things. And I think that's what we need to focus on in poverty is bringing the human side into it. It isn't all about functionality and a building here or a building there. It's about having facilities and people that are willing to invest their time and energy into other people. And I would support anything that, that goes along those lines. So I, I don't think the, the, the question was actually answered properly by each. This was about a very specific uh, initiative that the mayor has put forward. Um, I actually sat down with Steve Allen, who's co-chair uh, of the Stewardship Committee. They're running a constellation model, something I have some experience in. And, and, and what they're trying to do is, is to bring together all the organizations uh, uh, under an umbrella. Um, there's, there's 1,200 organizations in the city, and they're delivering 10,000 programs. So there's an immense amount of assets uh, out there. But what, what, the, what the, the initiative is trying to do is to, to get better utilization of these assets. And that's by bringing everybody around the table and organizing so that, so that we, we, we're not duplicating efforts around the city. And, and there's a ton of great people doing that. But this specific initiative uh, from the mayor uh, is, is moving forward great. And, and they're trying to, they're, I think they're just organizing around the not-for-profit model right now. We need to make them a civic partner, uh, not dissimilar to, to the CED or CADA, so that they have a they have funding model to, to really push forward with these all of these different individual efforts. We need some leadership there, so I'd be happy to do that. necessarily rebuttal, just making sure I get the last word on this one. Um, again, going back to my opening statement, there's a political point of view and there's a bureaucratic point of view. They involve grants and institutions and all those other things. I want to emphasize it's the human aspect. It's people helping other people and working with other people, period. Okay, Ian, uh, you'll get this uh, question next. Um, followed by John Marr. With the government initiating a plan to support local sustainability in the food system, can we expect a more positive move toward urban agriculture? Yes, I hope so. Um, <laughs> urban agriculture is a funny one, and I, and I, I know Evan's not going to speak on this one, but he does have a, more of a background than I do on this one. Um, I, I would say that in my travels over the last month, nine months as I've, as I've come to this table, um, I've got to talk with a lot of people about different kinds of aspects of urban uh, growing and chickens. I hear about chickens and I hear about uh, community gardens. And at first it seemed odd to me. I, you know, I 
I grew up, you know, outside of a city in a rural. That's why I love living in an apartment building. And the fact that people, uh, the, the fact that people, you know, are eager to have these gardens, I just was like, I had a garden my whole life. It was no big deal. Um, but then we went out and saw some of these communities that have the community gardens, and everything that I'm for in the, in the inner city and in the Beltline, getting people out of their apartment buildings and talking with one another that they might just see at the bus stop was happening in all of these community gardens. And if that can happen with little six little plots, imagine what can happen with bigger and more and more investment by the city. One of the things that's frustrating is I went to a Beltline Community Association meeting and I got directed to Carlo over at St. Saint, uh, Saint, uh, Saint Stephen's Anglican to try and help them with their garden. And it just seems that there's this huge bureaucracy. To me, it's it's a couple pallets of wood and some dirt. Mm -hmm. uh, how much easier can it be and how much less bureaucracy do you think you should need? The city should go ahead, find the land for each one of these communities, give it to them and let them run. Oh, thank you very much. The, the, the old urban agricultural question. So we have been working on this with several different communities. In fact, the Ward 8 office has actually contributed financially to make sure this is being done in different communities. Wildwood being one. Martaloop, I believe, has another. Uh, Sonalta definitely has one. Um, there is one in Cliff Bungalow, and there's, there is actually 16 in Ward 8 right now, several of which have been funded since I've been alderman of Ward 8. Now, uh, we have about 1.2 million people. Does anybody actually think we're going to be able to feed everybody out of these urban plots? No, but it's actually a really great community building experience. It's a lot of fun for people to be able to, to share and harvest some vegetables and, and have some, some fresh food that they can actually say that they've grown. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's an important experience, but it's not going to be something that, that the municipality is going to absolutely be reliant on in the event of an emergency. And um, yeah, everybody knows my position on chickens. Thank you. <laughs> Any, uh, any tips? Um, uh, for, this will go to Evan Woolley with a response by uh, Ian Newman. Do you believe that this Calgary requires a city charter? What powers does the city need that it does not currently have? Evan. Um, cities don't have a revenue model outside of property taxes and fees for service. Um, it's, it's very difficult. Cities are growing. There's a ton, this is where most of the people live in the province and we don't have proper powers of revenue. Um, we were, cities actually don't exist outside of the Municipal Governance Act, which is very, very dated. Um, Mayor Nenshi and, and, and has been working really hard on a city's charter and I'm looking forward to working with him uh, and the province to, to overhaul um, to overhaul the Municipal Governance Act. It's a very complex document. It's going to take a lot of work, um, but we need to make those steps now because, again, is this, the, we cannot continue to rely on increasing uh, every year uh, our property taxes. And, I mean, again, our businesses, our small businesses, are carrying a huge burden, about 21% uh, burden of, uh, of, of this tax, and, and it's, it's not a great way. It's not a great way to tax this. And so a uh, city's charter is, is huge. It's very complex, though, um, but the mayor is taking some good steps towards that, and I uh, would look forward to working with him on that. Thank you. Uh, absolutely, I think we need a city charter. Um, from the research that I've done, it is a complicated document. It is a complicated thing. Um, boils down to me, or how, how I try to get it through my head is that basically we have one way of, or a couple ways of collecting money. One is through property tax, and the other through is through the fees and services that we provide. When a document, like the Municipal Act, sort of defines how we can do that, we're kind of left in a bad spot. If you're trying to diversify a business, if you're trying to find a way to bring property taxes down or bring other service fees down, you need to have some room to move. The city charter, I hope, when it gets written and how it gets written, we'll define those things better from the city's perspective. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a politician, I'm not a bureaucrat. I don't know how that will happen, but I believe in my heart that we do need a charter and that the people at the forefront of, of uh, defining that document will understand uh, it's to help us reduce property taxes and other fees to the average citizen. So, um, the Municipal Government Act hasn't been changed in over 20 years. This is a fundamental problem with the way that our city is governed and the way that we fall into, because under the umbrella, we are basically children of the province of Alberta. 
And right now, your property tax dollar is a 50 cent dollar. You're sending half of your money up to Edmonton in the, in the form of the education tax. As a result of that, what you're seeing is that every once in a while we get a municipal sustainability grant, $3.3 billion for the West Allentians and, and so on and so forth. But the reality is, is that we're sending $4 billion a year more to Edmonton than we get back every single year. And that's not only unfair, it's unsustainable for us as a municipality. The two largest cities in, in the province of Alberta, which are two-thirds of the population, are not getting their fair share. We need that to be changed. We're, I'm working on that with the mayor right now, and that's the new vision for, for Alberta and for our future. Thank you very much. Our final question in this room will go... Sorry, it's on my phone. One second. We get the chips after this, right? We'll see, we'll see. We'll, nego we'll negotiate. We'll negotiate. <laughs> I got something to say. Okay, our final... Uh, are they crisps for you? Tom, crisps. 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 Those are crisps, yes. <laughs> I have a bag for you. That's how you bribe me. <laughs> All right. Our uh, final question of this, uh, this round will go to uh, Evan Woolley, to be responded to by John Marr. What are your thoughts on halting new community developments until infrastructure catches up? Um, I'm not sure that we need to, uh, to halt them. I, I, the, the, the issue now is, is about uh, mo so much of a percentage of our new communities are, are, are being developed as opposed to our inner city developments. And I think that the spread is about 80, 98 to 3 percent. So of all the units that they're building in the city, I think 98 percent are, are, are in greenfield developments, and about three percent is that uh, is in is in uh, the inner city. Um, in the municipal development plan, I think that's coming down to about 50-50. So uh, th there is a plan moving forward in the growth management framework, which I support um, to move forward with that. I don't think we need to halt them, but I think they need to pay for themselves. Um, the capital costs versus the operating costs. So it costs a lot of money. Um, to build them, and the developers aren't covering that cost, but also the operating costs uh, of, 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 of running huge train lines, long roads, long water pipes, and then the, the, uh, the impacts that those have on our, on our own inner city communities moving in is a lot. So uh, they've got the growth management framework. I'm supportive of that, um, but we need to start developing our brownfields and in our inner, inner cities and, and slow it down, but I don't think halting is the right, right decision. <laughs> With 37,000 people moving to Calgary this year, there's no way we're going to be able to stop new development. Um, the inner city establishment, established communities where we all live, like where I live in Scarborough, was at one time a suburb. Everybody, every community was at one time a suburb. We're going to continue to see that growth. What we need to do is make sure that when we're doing it, we're doing it in a smart and succinct way. Planet Calgary gave us the framework to do that, which is the 70-year vision for the city of Calgary, building around higher density around transportation corridors and nodes. We are doing that now. You're seeing that now at Westbrook Mall. You're seeing that at Sinalta. You're seeing that at other places in Ward 8. What you're also going to see is the new growth and framework for change. That's going to make sure that when we're developing new communities, we're doing it in a set group of criteria. I helped to create that. That's my record on, on this issue. I absolutely believe that we need to be able to grow up rather than out, but you're going to have some, some continued suburban growth. That's the fact of, of, of Calgary as we continue to be the economic driver for this province and for this country. We cannot stop growth. We need to make sure that we're planning for it in a proper way. We need to make sure when we're building, growth is being paid for by itself. Not just the suburban development, but also inner city development. All development needs to pay for itself in order for it to be fair. That's my record. That's what I bring to the table. That, that'll end our, uh, our CiviCam crowdsource questions. Before we go to break, I'm going to do the lightning round called the How Round. I went through your websites and I have a question for each of you about something on your website. Can we do uh, 45 seconds for this one? You'll each get 45 seconds, and if you want to use some of those precious chips, you can rebut. Uh, we'll start with... Can I know the question yet, John? No, no, I'm not. I can have it. Fine, fine. Woolley, on your website it says, Roads need fixing. Public transit has to be expanded. Pedestrian and cycling routes need further developments. 
and will fight for more lanes for buses and carpooling. Uh, so my question is, where would you like to see those uh, lanes for buses and carpooling? Um, lightning answer, uh, 11th and 12th Avenue. We can, uh, we can turn those into two ways and we can use bus lanes and our HOB lanes on either of those two coming in. Now, we, have a lot of, we have a lot of one way streets in this city that we can use for those. Um, for those. Yeah. Yeah. 30 more seconds. <laughs> our inner city transit needs a lot of love. We need inner city transit routes. We need pedestrian walking systems. And we need better bike lanes that, uh, that, that our inner city communities can use. Um, and our roads need work. And our sidewalks need work. <laughs> Can't be more efficient. Uh, we'll have next. We'll go with um, uh, John Marr. Your city website. Your sorry. Your your city campaign website? website. No, your campaign website. Okay. Said the way the city came together to deal with the Dune flood is an example of how traditional barriers and silos of city hall come down to allow things to be accomplished in record time. We need to ensure those barriers to productivity. But we need to ensure those barriers to productivity don't reemerge. Um, want to explain how? Have you seen signs of those, and uh, so far, and what? Uh, how would you accomplish that? So, who all was affected by the flood in this room? Several of you. And what you saw when we were running our uh, our little group, Mission Possible at uh, Mission Safeway, is that we were able to deliver an amazing amount of services. Police were there, EMS were there, fire was there. We were running garbage trucks and so on and so forth. All, everything that we needed was getting done by, by city staff. How is that possible during that short amount of time? What we need to do is make sure that when we're hiring our new city manager, and when we're going through our general manager process, more at the time, that we, we are absolutely able to communicate to them, this is the new way of doing business, this is what Calgarians expect, and we need to be able to provide those new services for Calgarians when they need it. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, did you put it in the chip? No, I didn't. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, you get the last question, Ian. Um, from your website, I read, I accept the responsibility of building a city which is inclusive and supportive of our LGBT community including their freedom, families and friends, their dignity in the streets, and their rights and freedoms in our businesses and administration. How, as a city councillor, would you accomplish that, Ian? Well, I think I'd accomplish it the same way I accomplished it as a human being. <laughs> I mean, um, we need to make sure that we're supporting our, the diversity in our communities, wherever that comes from. Um, we spoke to a lot of people. That, that comment made it into my, into my webpage uh, right after the Pride Parade. Um, we were able to meet with a lot of people in the community about that, and we got to hear a lot of horror stories. And out of those horror stories, uh, we sort of sat back and said, I, I didn't realize there's so much uh, of this stuff going on. I mean, we, we hear, you know, Calgary's a redneck city or a seventh vessel. I'm going to use extra time, so. Um, and, they say, and they say, and, and we hear things like, you know, you know when Mayor Nenshi was, was elected, um, they said it was great, you know, that we had a, such a progressive society that we have a, the first Muslim mayor in the Western world of a major city, and we all get this feeling of, you know, Calgary is growing up and it's and it's shedding its its past, I guess, a little bit of the the redneck mentality. But when we get out there and talk with people, we hear that maybe that isn't quite as true. Uh, there there still is people getting beat up. There still is uh, prejudices and discriminations both within the administration and people that work for the city and for other jobs. And if we're trying to attract the best of the best, the best of the best don't always look like us, they always don't act like us, uh, but we need them, they're smart, and they're, and they're essential to the fabric of our community. So I would just ensure, just as I treat everybody every day, uh, that while on council, that I'm promoting that ethos and making sure that, that we are, a, you know, a unified front when it comes to everybody in our society. about yourself further, Ian? I'm science divide. Okay, we're going to take a... a <laughs> we're, that's very good. We're gonna take a, we'll take a 15-minute break now. Don't forget, on either side, there are uh, some papers to uh, write in the questions. Uh, because there are a lot of you, I want to make sure we get all the questions we can in. Um, so write them and give them uh, to one of our assistants here. Uh, and we'll see you back at 8.15. Thank you very much. Nothing in this bucket of fries. I did. I'm glad we're back.
commissioned a report called the Hero Report, and you can go on calgary.ca and have a look at it. But this is a really, really critical issue for mobility as well as safety. So council, as you may know, have actually just released another 60 plates. And these plates are going to be uh, GPS located, so we're going to be able to make sure that there's enough cabs out there. But the real issue is that the cab drivers don't want to drive the midnight to 4 a.m. shift because it's it's dangerous and they know that. Um, what we're going to have to do is really focus and ask them or, or maybe require the industry to install protective shields for their drivers as a mandatory measure to make it safer for the drivers which means that they'll also uh, be able to, to, to uh, be more willing to drive. The other thing I want to think about is, and I, I tried this, I talked about it earlier, was to create a uh, late night surcharge of about three dollars which will allow people to, to be able to... Thank you John. Get more cops. <laughs> does this work if I? Um, taxis is definitely a problem in the downtown core, and I'm sure everywhere else. I can remember about a year ago uh, trying to get from a buddy's house in Bridgeland, couldn't get through, couldn't get through. I said, you know what? I'll walk down the LRT. Walk down the LRT, ended up on the LRT and coming all the way home. I got home. It took me about an hour with the with the whole walking and everything, um, but. When I speak with cab drivers time and time again, they tell us there's something wrong between the broker and the cab driver. I don't know what it is yet, but there's some breakdown there. It, it has to do with the licenses. I think if we can renegotiate a deal with developers, we can renegotiate a deal with the people who hold those broker's licenses and try and get cabbies with their licenses, with their cabs, Operating a business that they want to what that they want to run and not some guy owning a whole bunch of plates and having a Mirage of people working for him that don't want to be there and feel like they're there for slave labor or Have to work 12 hours a day just to make the money to pay for the cab that they're renting for the day uh, Give give the people of empowerment and give them their cab. Thank you. Mr. Newman Our next uh, chips uh, our next question will go to uh, Mr. Woolley and rebuttal by um, John Mark. Uh, prove you have done your flood mitigation homework. Describe a flood mitigation solution aside from upstream infrastructure. So uh, describe a 
flood mitigation measure you'd like to see or you think could work within the city of Calgary? Um, dredging the dam. Uh, it's an expensive option, but it's an option that can work. It's something we can do quickly. Uh, it, it, it is expensive and it's not permanent, but it's, it's the quickest, fastest fix uh, for us to ensure. I mean, we don't, we don't know when it's coming next. Some of the long-term, uh, some of the permanent upstream mitigation solutions can take you know, five to ten years, but uh, dredging the dam can be, happen quite quickly and would be an effective way. So the City of Calgary actually has a whole new policy and implementation plan on the flood. The ironic thing is, is that it was actually delivered for a request for proposal on the day of the flood. So very, very strange. What we need to do is we need to make sure that when that report comes back, we're going to be implementing the plans that are coming. That's done with the province of Alberta and the government of Canada. One thing that we know has worked for sure was the creation of the permanent berm in Inglewood. That is something that absolutely stood up when it needed to. That's something that we need to implement along our, our, our banks when we're doing that. But the only way we're going to be able to do this is if we have the province and the federal government on board, which they've, they've uh, said that they will do so. Thank you. This one's for uh, Ian Newman and Evan Woolley. Uh, Mr. Newman, how would you deal with the ever-increasing homeless population? Um, again, a very, very complicated question. And I think we've talked about it a lot tonight. It comes down to getting the rents reasonable so people can afford them, empower, empowering people, make, just making sure that our society, the fabric of our society, supports those people that are vulnerable and provides people with the options that they need. When we say homelessness, uh, homelessness isn't just the person that we see walking down the street. I mean, it's people that are living out in foothills, that are staying in homeless shelters, that are working full time every day because they can't afford to live here. Uh, they can't afford to live in, in, the, in the apartments and the places that we have. So I think by increasing the, the, uh, the supply of rental properties and providing affordable housing, we go a long way in that. And also dealing, unfortunately, with the uh, with the mental illness side of the equation and making sure that the support mechanisms are there and places like Alpha House and other uh, institutions are there to support those vulnerable people. Yeah, uh, it, it's unfortunate that uh, our provincial government over, over the last 20 years uh, has substantially cut a lot of the programs that deal with uh, drug and alcohol abuse and mental health. This is a really long, uh, a sort of more of a medium to long range solution. Um, we can do housing now, we can do a lot, a lot of things, but we, we need to deal with the, a lot of the root problems of mental health and we need to build up our supports and we need to increase funding for organizations that are, are dealing with mental health and, and alcohol and drug abuse, uh, whether that's treatment centers um, and dealing with the root problem. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna put this one to all three because it's a bit of a challenge. It's a know your community or know this community, know my community. Uh, what uh, what what does Bankview need, and what's not being done in Bankview, and what would you do to improve uh, uh, what ails Bankview? If what you, yeah, we'll <laughs> <laughs> the question wasn't worth that bringing. That <laughs> All right, what would you do for Bankview, and uh, why? And let's start with uh, John Mark. Okay, go down the table. So that's an excellent question, and it leads us into the whole inspiring neighborhoods. Uh, strong neighborhoods conversation and if anybody who actually is from Bankview so there's a few of you and we actually this winter went and did a walkabout with the inspiring strong neighborhoods team which is asking you what is it that you want in your communities we came back with a whole bunch of of uh, different options which is going to be how do we implement the things that you need in your community whether it's fixing Buckmaster Park doing the community garden fixing up your community halls, or making sure that your street lights are, are as bright as they can be, paving your sidewalks, all of these types of things. The Inspiring Strong Neighborhoods is a policy that's coming to be able to address the needs, not just in Bankview, not just in Wildwood and Westgate, where, where these, this pilot project was being run, but it's going to be a new way of delivering services for Calgary. That's what needs to be done. Uh, not just in Bankview, but throughout our inner city communities. Thank you.
We don't need to do any more pilot projects about what we need in our communities. All we need to do is talk to people. Uh, Bankview is struggling uh, with a lot of uh, a lot of engagement in their neighborhood. So actually, volunteerism in the community is a big thing. Uh, the, the the city has been decreasing uh, services to to cut lawns, and the community and, 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 and shovel walks in the community is having to take on a lot of that burden. So we, we need uh, resources for neighborhoods to engage their community to increase memberships. Um, the Inspiring Strong Communities was uh, was an initiative that was two hundred twenty five thousand dollars of which $175,000 went to consultants and marketing. And only $50,000 was delivered to communities. And this is exactly what is wrong with the current council, is, is that we don't need to do any more pilot projects to figure out what happens in communities. Our property tax dollars should be being reinvested back into our neighborhoods, and we don't need little pilots with little pots of money to fix the sidewalk or a corner here. We need to do this on an ongoing basis, and we need to engage our neighborhoods properly around this. So the Inspiring Strong Neighborhoods is about doing business in a completely different way. So when you're talking about policies, and that's what we do at, as a board of governors, if you will, that's what your role of council and the mayor is. It's about doing big picture things for the entire city of Calgary and all of its 167 communities. We can't just pick and choose. You've got to make sure that what you're doing is the right thing for all of your communities. And when we're doing that, and the Inspiring Strong Neighborhoods is a policy document that's going to shape and change the way that we deliver services to the citizens of Calgary. That's the big picture. That's what experience tells you we need to do. That's how you're going to affect change at the neighborhood level. And that's why I need your support to drive that point home when we come back to the polls on October 21st. Thank you. This question will go to Ian uh, and uh, and John. Uh, Ian, uh, how would you address the Epcor Center really financial really situation? Yeah. Oh, that's sorry. I never let Ian answer the question. Oh, that's right. It was a three-person question. <laughs> <laughs> that's all. That's all right. I mean, at the end of the day, all that I was going to say is I, I prefer to shy away from questions that are "What can you do for me?" We hear a lot of that when we go on the knock of doors. You know. I don't think it's our job to go, what am I going to do for any individual person? Uh, I would do the same thing for every community. I would list them, try to empower what they want to have done, and try to engage the community and make it grass roots up and not me telling the community what they need. I'll be there to listen, and I'll be there to try to work with the administration and build the relationships needed to get you what you need in your community. Thank you very much. Uh, this one will be for uh, Mr. Newman and Mr. Marr. Um, how would you address the EPCOR Center's financial situation? <laughs> I, I'm not a politician nor a bureaucrat, so I'm humble enough to say I do not know enough about it, and I will look into it and I'll put something on my website. So EPCOR Center for Performing Arts is one of our grand buildings. Uh, it was recently damaged by the flood. We have a whole plan to work with uh, the Calgary Arts Development Authority in bringing forward the new vision for what EPCOR could be. Uh, first of all, I think we should change it from EPCOR to something that's actually here in Calgary, but that's, that's, another, that's another story. What we need to do is work together with the Calgary Arts Development Authority, with the arts community, and also with a new major sponsor that's going to be able to tie in exactly on the new plan for uh, a performing arts center in downtown Calgary. This one will go to Mr. Woolley, then Mr. Newman. Um, what are you going to do about uh, the fact that once composting comes in, we'll have three dumpsters and bins in people's backyards? It's a major eyesore. Green, black, and blue. I'll turn you black and blue. Threatening <laughs> 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 the moderator, um, that's the penalty for that would be uh, Peter. <laughs> So we'll have a first question first uh, to you, Mr. Woolley. Um, I know that they're piloting uh, the composting program uh, in, in some neighborhoods. We need multi-unit recycling in our inner cities before we start going on, on citywide composting programs. So I, I really want to work hard uh, to bring multi-unit recycling. So before we start composting, let's 
Let's, let's create an equal cast of citizens, whether you live in a multi-unit or you live in a single detached, and let's bring that to our inner cities. Um, we also have the 80-20 by 2020, uh, and that's reducing eight, or taking 80% of our trash away from the, uh, out of our landfills um, by the year 2020. And we can't meet that target without uh, a composting program. So I think we need to keep our eye on the prize. Let's get multi-unit recycling in. Uh, they are three very, very large bins. And, and there's, there are some ideas kicking around about how we can reduce the size or whether they can actually alternate. So one week you would have, um, one week you'd have garbage, one week you'd have recycling. So then it would take a lot of, it would, it would decrease, um, decrease the amount of time and resources needed uh, to, uh, to deal with our waste and recycling. <laughs> I guess I'm lucky I live in a tall building where all I have to do is walk to the shoot and that's all I get to do. Uh, my bottles and cans I have to put in my truck and drive to the nearest uh, recycling uh, recycling center. Um, so like Evan, and I, and I hate doing this because I know you guys wouldn't have a choice, but multifamily is a big issue. And I, and I think the reason why multifamily recycling has sort of been pushed off the side is it isn't low hanging fruit. It isn't easy. It's easy to put another bin in the backyard of a single family dwelling. It's not easy to tackle the question of how do you deal with the city administration and all the different contractors that are involved currently with garbage pickup. The question is, is that, do, not the question, but the answer is we need to engage these people because when we engage all of these contractors and all of the city that's involved with collecting that garbage to try and answer Blue Box, we're going to answer a lot of other questions about how multi-families can function properly in a city as this city grows up and it's going to grow up and up and up and up and if we don't solve the questions now where are we going to be in 20 years we need to get on that mm -hmm. so this one's going to be for mr mar and mr newton the calgary public library is the second busiest in canada the sixth busiest in north america but funded, funded significantly less per capita than any other major library in Canada. How will you ensure that the CPL receives stable and more funding? So, actually, the Calgary Public Library has been increasing in its demand over the last several years. Uh, people were always suggesting that, that libraries were going to die. That's not the case, and that's exactly why we're reinvesting in the new downtown public library, and we're reinvesting in all of our, our, what I like to call, palaces of knowledge throughout different neighborhoods. How are we going to be able to make sure that the, the citizens are getting what they need? The way to do that is to make sure that we're working in partnership with the Calgary Public Library Board and that we're adequately funding our, our library staff. That's something that we've been working on and continuing to work with into, uh, uh, to ensure that we have the resources that we need. But the first thing is build the libraries. That's what the, your city council is doing. For the first time, we're going to see a brand new major public library in downtown Calgary. I don't necessarily have an answer for this question, but I will take, uh, I will look at one uh, aspect of what you said. Uh, that it's underfunded based on per capita, based on another city at an, in another place. I don't think that's the way we should do anything. I mean, a facility operates because, because it needs a certain amount of funds. Tell us what that number is and let's work to get it. Don't tell me that you need more just because another city has more. Tell me what you need and let's get a budget and let's make it work. And not just creating these random numbers, not random, but not just using these numbers based on other cities. Tell us what you need to make it work properly. Let's get the budget for it and let's make it happen. Uh, this question goes to uh, Mr. Woolley, then Mr. Marr. What would you do about drug houses in the community? Sorry, for this, for who and who? Uh, yourself, uh, Mr. Woolley, then yourself. Yeah. Um, th this this question's come up in, in, in a couple communities, uh, and it's of critical, critical importance. Um, I believe Rick Hansen has done a really great job as police chief. We've reduced crime in the Beltline and in our inner, in our downtown core significantly. Uh, he took cops out of their cars and put them on the street, and that and, and it's worked really well. The problem that it's done though is that it's pushed some of the crime into our into our other inner city neighborhoods. And I live in Mission, we've seen a bit of it pushed down into Mission, and Sonalta has seen it significantly pushed in Sonalta, Bankview. And so we need to extend the beat cop routes. Um, and, um, and cops need to come in, into, into our communities and be walking around. But, but, uh, but safety and, and, and is, is much more than just policing. Um, we need to, to 
engaged neighborhoods. Uh, we need to build vibrant streets. We need to build programming in our neighborhoods because more eyes on the streets create uh, safer neighborhoods. So the more people we can bring out of our houses and into the streets uh, will significantly uh, deal with a lot of these issues. Um, Thank you. So I don't think anybody needs to get a lecture on, on uh, my record on, on policing. So we've hired 300 new police officers. Our crime rate is down by 35%. And our, our crime rate is actually the same level as it was in 1974. What we really, thank you. Uh, what we really need to do is make sure when we're working in partnership with the province of Alberta, creating new legislation like the Safe Communities and Neighborhood Act, what we need to do is make sure that those loopholes stay closed when we're identifying them. These criminals are not stupid. They are able to adapt to the legislation faster than the province can change it. So when we are creating new legislation to empower communities, put, putting in police officers in your neighborhoods as community liaison officers, that's exactly what we're doing. But th we have to make sure that the federal justice system and the provincial justice system is turning as fast as the criminals are and adapting to their to their needs. Thank you. And uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, this will go to Mr. Newman and Mr. Woolley. Uh, only three of Calgary's wards don't extend to Calgary city limits. How can the inner city get fair treatment when our interests may not be shared with the majority of council? And the bonus question for applause from the media and respect from the, the audience is, what three wards are those? <laughs> Eight. Uh, I knew this because it was asked at another, uh, another meeting. I don't know the answer. To Eight, nine, and seven. Good job. Evan wins the prize. <laughs> <laughs> um, at the end of the day, I think it comes, as with, I, I was speaking very recently with a very high bureaucrat at the city of Calgary, and I said, if I get elected, uh, what's the one piece of advice you're going to give me? And he said it point blank. He said, council is about building relationships and about getting things done. You need to make sure that you build relationships with those on council and those in the administration so that when you call them, they pick up the phone. And I can guarantee you that if I'm elected, I am the type of guy that will build those relationships and I will pick up the phone for others so that they will pick up the phone for me. So how will I get anything done? The same way I'll get everything else done. Building good relationships, helping other councillors get what they want for their communities, so that they'll help me get what I need for our communities. Yeah, you know, it, it is about relationship building, and it's about having a really good grasp of, our, of, of what's happening in the city. Um, it's also about knowing, uh, uh, knowing uh, Robert's rules of order when you're sitting on council. Uh, it's critical. One of the best pieces of, uh, of advice I've gotten is, is when you get, if you get elected, when you get elected, um, learn Robert's rules of order. Learn the rules of council because that is the most powerful tool you can have. But we, what we also need is we need somebody out fighting for our communities every day. We need representation in the inner city, and we need people. We need we need a, we need a councillor who's going to fight for the issues of this riding, and to be loud about it, and to push, and to always be engaging, and and, and to and to be just working really really hard. And we don't have that representation now. And I'm looking forward to providing for everybody here. Ward, not riding. Thank you. <laughs> um, yes, it, it, it is a ward. Um, I've worked at many level, different levels of government. <laughs> And, and it can be confusing phases, but it, it is about word representation, and, and it's about good representation, and it's also about accountability. Um, if, 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 we have, uh, if we have a representative who's accountable to people and who can be open and honest with the communities that he's working with, then we'll be much, much more effective on council. Thank you. Uh, that ends our questions tonight. Um, <laughs> I'd like to provide our, each of our candidates one minute to uh, close out our evening. Uh, we started this way. We'll, uh... Thank you. I, I love my audience. <laughs> All right, so we'll start with John Marr, uh, Ian Newman, then uh, Evan Bowie. Thank you. So it is about relationships. The first thing that um, then Mayor Bronconi told me 
when I was elected is you've got to learn how to count to eight. I have the relationships both with my colleagues uh, and the administration to make sure that we get the job done. And that's been my track record for the last six years, getting things done. All you have to do is look at the minutes, look at the things that your city council has accomplished. Uh, I'm proud of the accomplishments that we, we've achieved as your council, and I'm proud of the relationships that I have with, the, with all of my colleagues, whether it's in the administration or the members of council. Uh, and I'm very, very pleased that uh, our mayor has endorsed me as his choice for Ward 8. So thank you very much. I guess in closing, all that I'd like to say is that unlike the incumbent, I don't have a track record that I can show you and say that I've done this. But I would argue that the things that have happened in the past have happened. And, and we have to look towards the future. The things that the count, last council was unable to do, some of them are still on the table. And in order to get those things through, we're going to need new faces on council. Maybe not a full spectrum change, but we do need to have some change to bring uh, to bring to the table. And Ward 8 especially needs some of that change. Um, I've been told over the last couple weeks that uh, because of my humor and because I, I like to uh, maybe not take myself a little too seriously, but they said, are you serious for this job? And I have to say, I absolutely am. I wouldn't put my money down, and I wouldn't be asking for money from family if I wasn't absolutely serious. You guys, need, you guys have a choice before you, status quo, Evan's vision, or my vision, which is basically just an ordinary person table. I'd love your vote. And if you don't like me, I just vote and vote for somebody up here that you identify. <laughs> um, this is a critical election for our neighborhoods. Uh, the choice is clear. Um, and and we, we need to move forward to build the communities that we want. Can you imagine a councillor who puts our neighborhoods first? Uh, lights off. Um, we can do so much better. We can build great city here. We can, but we need to have somebody that's fighting every single day for us. And we need to have somebody that's going to engage. This election is not just about me. This election, I brought a campaign team and I've engaged so many people that have so many ideas. And it's about a galvanizing voice for all of the shared asp aspirations and ideas from our neighborhoods. We can do so much better. And this is, the, this is the politics of imagination and of intelligence, not the status quo and opportunism. It's a different kind of politics. It's the next generation of politics, and I would invite you all to join me. Um, I'm gonna put in my extra uh, chip here, because I did have one more. <laughs> Check out the report card. We have a report card that the mayor uh, put to citizens, and we'd be happy to share that with you tonight. It's a report card, and it's very, very important. And thank you very much, and looking forward to you, all your support. Thank you who wrote in questions, sorry we couldn't get to all of them.